almost all climate scientists now agree, if we don't make big changes to how we get our energy real soon, we are gonna face some major storm-inducing, nation-flooding, lung-choking, money-draining trouble. And one way to get off coal and oil is to use the power of the sun. The sun's big and bright and it's not going anywhere soon. But the trouble is, more than 80% of our solar electricity comes from crystalline silicon panels. Those are heavy, they're expensive, they're, they're just inconvenient. So scientists are coming up with some pretty bright alternatives to capture the power of the sun, as we see in this Brink Breakthrough. With glass solar panels, it's really hard to get them onto your roof. They're heavy and they're expensive. In fact, 50% of the cost of getting a solar panel on your roof is the installation. Boston architect Sheila Kennedy sees an alternative. It's called organic thin film photovoltaics. Organic thin film is something that's much different and very interesting. This is an emergent new technology where in an organic chemistry lab, photovoltaic dyes are synthesized. You can actually think about them as liquid solar materials. The dyes, made from ruthenium and other elements, serve as solar collectors that can be turned into thin strips and woven into textiles with some impressive properties. They're pretty rugged. You can trop on them. And they're flexible. You can shape this in any way that you like. So I can put this like this and make a cone right out of it. How to put that fabric to use? Well, by decorating and powering what Kennedy calls a soft house. It allows the homeowner to take about half of the electricity that the household would normally consume, take that and take that off the grid and supply it with renewable, clean energy in the form of solar textiles. Some of those solar curtains would be outside the house, others would be inside, dropping down from skylights. The curtains would charge batteries during the day to supply electricity later on, but they wouldn't power everything in the house. It's a hybrid house. That is, it'd use regular AC power from the grid for appliances. But it would harvest the sun for LED lights and other lower power needs. You might plug your laptop in, or maybe you plug in a digital camera. You might be able to plug in a PDA. Reality check here, those organic thin films aren't nearly as efficient as solar panels. But because they're so flexible, Kennedy thinks they have a great future. The immediate future is probably in developing countries. Her firm is designing solar blankets, solar bags, and inexpensive LED lights for use where electrical grids are iffy. But the soft house may have its day too. A grant from MIT could put solar textile lighting into 20,000 homes in Portugal within the next few years. Of course, all kinds of solar cells do need to become more efficient, but how exactly do you do that? Well, Brink contributor and senior science advisor to the Department of Energy, Dwight Williams, joins me now from Washington, D.C., with one amazing answer to that question. Josh, in this case, the answer is nanotechnology, which is no big shock. But what may surprise you is where this nanotechnology comes from. A bubbling brew in a lab in Corvallis, Oregon. What's inside could give a big boost to solar technology. Its inventor, Mother Nature. We've taken an ancient organism that already knows how to capture light very efficiently. It's done it for millions of years. That organism is the diatom, a one-celled plant. Diatoms build silica shells pocked with nano-sized pits, some just a few atoms across. The way light bounces around in those pits helps the diatom convert more sunlight into energy. It seems that it can work exactly the same way in a solar cell. We've taken that critical aspect of this very tiny organism and we've integrated that into a modern day device. Greg Rohr leads a team at Oregon State University and at Portland State. They grow diatoms by the billions, then place them on glass plates. In the time lapse video that you're seeing right now, we see the cells settle onto this glass surface and then they move about the surface. Once they fill the surface, the living material is removed so that only the silica shells remain. A thin layer of titanium dioxide is added, which interacts with the light to generate electricity. In tests, solar panels with the diatoms yield about triple the electricity of identical panels without them. We've just started to illustrate the potential of these diatom cells to enhance next generation technologies for uh, solar energy. 
But we think this process, although it's in its uh, infant stages, holds enormous promise for future application. Many nanotech projects have been hobbled because it's tough to make nanoparticles in large volume. But Greg Rohrer points out that nature's already figured out how to make diatoms in industrial scale quantities. He's already working with an Israeli firm to bring into commercial production. Josh? Thanks, Dwight. It, it, it's interesting. What role do you think these diatom enhanced solar panels will play in the future? I see them playing two roles. I see diatoms serving as a foundation for research that shows that a lot of engineering's difficult problems can be solved through simple biology. And in addition, I can see a whole new area of research that makes each and every individual solar panel a lot more, um, a lot more energy efficient. I mean, it, it, it's all very interesting, but it does kind of seem that solar has been the energy of the future for decades now. We've, we've always been talking about how solar is the next big thing. Why hasn't it really taken off yet? Well, actually, it has started to take off. Um, for the past several years, solar has increased its output by 30% per year. And, and it, you have to also keep in mind that solar is one piece of an enormous energy market. And sometimes it takes a while to start to see such um, progress compared to the more traditional technologies. Well, uh, how long do you think it's going to take? I mean, look ahead for us. What's the solar outlook for, you know, say, 2030? Oh, the, the potential is tremendous. Um, we could have, in 2030, solar serving as up to 30% of America's energy usage needs. Um, we could also have solar being so versatile, so viable, that it serves lots of different applications in an energy efficient and a cheap manner. Okay, well, cross fingers. Thanks for your time, Dwight. Thank you. Coming up on Brink, imagine a car factory that recycles and reuses.